Welcome back. We are here for week four of our discipleship character study. Uh, it's a study that's available uh, right here on our on Facebook as we post it, but also available on our YouTube channel and available through our website as well. Um, the book itself is free. And we can get a copy to you at any time. Uh, www.fireinaction.com or you can email us at info at fireinaction.com and we'll get a copy to you. I believe it'll be a great blessing to you and helping you raise your level in your journey and your burn and your fire to chase after God, knowing how he's called you to live and exist in these times and how he's called you to be a great witness for him, to be a minister of reconciliation for him in these times. But first, we must we must have our house in order if we are going to go out and step out in faith and share the gospel. So that means that we must know and understand many things, including the most foundational thing, the one who gave us the very salvation that we live from, and that is Jesus. So here's the thing about Jesus. He is God. And a lot of you are saying, well, I know that, but there's so much question about that, even in the church today, that Jesus is actually the physical representation and manifestation of God. He is. He was. That's who he was when he walked the earth. He was God. Yes, he refers to himself as the son of God, but he was actually physically God. He was God in the flesh. If you want to know if another religion is some sort of cult in some kind of way, ask them that one particular question. Do you believe that Jesus is God? Not do you believe Jesus is the son of God? Not do you believe that Jesus is on the same level with God or Jesus is at certain levels of wisdom or, or anything of that nature, ask him that simple question. Do you believe Jesus is God? Because if they don't say yes to that, then you know that they are following something false and not the truth. Because he is the truth, the way, and the life. Those are his words. And the Bible is littered with examples of showing that he is God. We'll get to that in a moment. So... John 3, 16 is, of course, the, the most, one of the most famous, if not most famous verse in the Bible, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So what do we see here? We see the, a physical action from God himself that then, cre that then is met by a spiritual action from us believing in what God did. Well, what did he do? He came to the earth. Why did he come to the earth? Well, first of all, he made us because he loves us and he wants us to be with him. He wants us to be with him in paradise forever. But we have this thing called sin that, that, that created a gap between us and him. And God hates sin. So the only way that our sins can be forgiven, the only way the gap can be bridged is not through our actions, because our righteousness is nothing but filthy rags, the word the book of Isaiah says. So in, other, in, in order for us to see that gap bridge, someone had to do it. And the only one who could do it is someone who's perfect in nature. So that brings me to one of my first key points today about learning and understanding a little bit more about Jesus. Many of us may know this, some of you may not, but Jesus is the only one in history who's dual in nature. You know, we as humans are 100% human in nature. Jesus, as a human, was 100% human in nature. But remember, Jesus is also God. So therefore, he is also 100% godly in nature. Now, I know you're thinking, how can someone, if there's only 100% to, to have, how can someone contain 200%? It's one of the great mysteries of understanding and knowing God. And, and it, it points to a, a thought that I've had in recent months about God. And it's simply this. I, I love the fact that I can't figure out everything there is to figure out about God. This is part of what, how God is God. And we can't fully comprehend and understand that he is God. But what we can trust in and know is that God is God. And if I could understand everything there was to understand about God, then would God really be God? 
He is other than, which means he operates, dwells, and has a full range of understanding in a realm that we cannot fully comprehend. I love that. I love the fact that it's so incredibly challenging to explain how someone who walked this earth as a human being could also be God. But you know what? I know and believe that he was because the word of God says that. Uh, in Colossians 1, it says, being God, Jesus, let me just stop right there. What does it say? Being God, Jesus. So it's saying that Jesus is saying, I am God. The word is saying that he was God. Before it even tells you what the rest of the verse says, being God, Jesus. The rest of the verse says this, Jesus never had a beginning, nor does he have an end. For in him, all things were created, things in heaven, on earth, visible and invisible. Now think about this. Can we as man create something? Can we make something that is visible? Of course. The other day for breakfast, I got some potatoes and chopped up my potatoes and some onions and, and some garlic and seasoned them well and and I got three eggs. Don't judge me because I ate three eggs. I need my protein. I got my three eggs and I put those together in a pan as well. And I cooked up my potatoes and I got them all together on a plate. And I got three corn tortillas. Yes, I was hungry. I just gotten back from the gym. And I ate all of that in one sitting, yes. And <clears throat> it's fair to say that, I mean, I could visibly see what I was partaking of. And I know that these are the hands that made it. I created something that was visible. Mankind creates things that are visible. You ever tried to make anything that is actually invisible? Only one man could do that. And that man would have to be godly in nature in order to be able to do that. Further proof of who he was. Further solidifying his dual nature as both 100% man and 100% God. Something that only he could make the claim to. And obviously, one of the other key ways we know of him and believe in him is as our what? Our savior, our redeemer. Colossians 1 says this, he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom. And that gives you a picture of what? We needed rescue. If you need rescue, that means you are in trouble. You are drowning. You are dying. You need to be rescued from something. You need to be saved from something. And obviously for us, that was our sin. For all of mankind, that's our sin. And he came once and once for all and died for all of mankind. And it says that what happens next? We are transferred. Well, if you're transferred to the kingdom, that must mean the eternal destination that was in store for you was not the kingdom in order to be transferred to the kingdom based on his action and not yours. So he rescues us by becoming the atonement for our sins. He becomes the, the curse on the tree for us that we deserve to, to, to receive. And because of that, a transfer, the greatest transfer in history takes place on your benefit and mine. We're transferred from an eternity separate from God to an eternity with God, something that we cannot do on our own. Ephesians 2 puts it this way. It is grace that what he did for us, right? Grace that is not of ourselves, but a gift from God. He gifted us that by gifting us his son, by gifting us, gifting us himself in flesh. This is just a small snippet and a few nuggets of what Jesus did for us and who he is in that process. So here's the thing. Some of what we teach each week, you'll say, I know this. I'm fully aware of this. But here's part of the reason we teach it so that you will have simplistic manners and ways in which you can take this truth out to the world and share it with them, out to the ones who don't know truth, because that's what you're called to do. You're called to not only hear this, you're called to receive this. You're not only called to receive this, you're called to live it. But you're not just called to live it, you're called to share it. That is a mandate of the church, the Great Commission. So as you hear these words each week, 
and you digest them and you look at your own life and figure out areas and places where you need to shift and change things or you need to expand your knowledge and grow, take that, but then also remember it's not supposed to stop there. Push it forward into the hearts and minds of the ones that God puts on your heart as you step out into your daily life. God bless you. Look forward to sharing with you again next week in our next part of our series. And remember always live truth and share truth.